Well, you see, now it makes sense. Now, I'm waiting something in front of the camera that is not mysterious, that is not enigmatic, that does not need explanation. Indeed, it is quite self-explanatory, quite revelatory, quite expository, maybe not that well-centered, but I think you get the basic idea. If you're seeing this graphic right now, this image, this visual, you know exactly what's happening. Do I have to spell it out for you? Probably not, but I will. It is indeed Tent Talks Tunes. And you just saw by the picture graph, by the hieroglyph, TTT, -t -t, baby. Yes, welcome aboard, everybody. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ms. Gelman from Tucson, Arizona. Hello, I hope, Greg and Cindy Crawford from Pensacola, Florida. I hope you guys are tuned in right now. There's Mike from Vancouver, BC. I was talking to him early this morning about delicious vegan food and punk rock and things of that nature. Yes, yes, yes. I see everybody's logging in and coming on board, which is quite a rarity. Today I was able to log on pretty much just about painlessly for the first time in a long time. James Pogo, salute from the Armed Delight Rifles. Hello, hello. Yeah, I might actually be getting the hang of this brand new fancy schmancy camera that I plunked down the big bucks for a few months ago. Um... It's kind of what I thought it was supposed to be. You plug it in and you let it roll. Ha! Imagine that. Just like the old days, you take a Super 8 camera, right? A Super 8 film camera. So simple. You pop open the door. You drop the film in. You close the door. You crank the little handle. Point and shoot. That's all it took. Nothing to it. Analog technology. So easy. a toast to old analog technology, but also one to current modern day newfangled technology, because let's face it, with that Super 8 millimeter film camera, you did not have the ability to reach literally a worldwide audience simultaneously. So as much of a damned annoyance as this thing can be, you gotta love it. So I love it. Cheers, everybody. Got a gallon of Danbury tap. Ready to salute you. All right. So it's really, really cool, funny, interesting, and great. I woke up this morning, as happens occasionally, without any idea whatsoever of what I was going to talk about today. And um, so I put out a little all points bulletin to my friendly fans, my felicitous friends, my vibratory viewers, my vivacious uh bon vivants out there for an idea or two and it was really cool the first two people who suggested something immediately triggered something in my old semi-calcified brain and i got this week's topics all lined up and if you can see the header it's three bands that on the surface of it don't have much to do with each other but somehow actually do and it was a lot of fun actually putting those pieces together so thank you uh murray gelman for suggesting that. And, um, oh gosh, I'm of course drawing a blank. Who was the other person who suggested that I talk about something? Um, was it Adam? Adam Bomb Zisser from Atlanta? I think it was Adam Bomb Zisser from Atlanta who made the suggestion. So between the two of you guys, we got this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. But of course, before we dig into the vegan meat of the matter, we got to check a few things. We got to check the mailbox, got to check the bulletin board, got to bring you guys up to snuff on the current deeds of daring do here in the world of old man tent. I'm a busy guy. I'm a busy, busy man, mofos. And the reason actually that I did not have anything to talk about today is because I have been working triple overtime in the mailroom. Now, if you're Seeing what you see on the screen here, it looks very placid, it looks very calm. Clintonzilla would tune in right now and see, you know, 
your average cable TV station studio setup with a backdrop and some graphics and a somewhat snappily dressed host. I think the angle's a little bit crooked right now, but what are you going to do? It's in the spirit of cable TV. This is not network TV. This is DIY television coming at you live on Facebook and archived forever on, nope, not there, but there, my YouTube channel on my permanent record. Check it out. Um, yeah, I've been working real, real, real hard in the mailroom the past four days because if you guys have been following my social media posts, you might have noticed John Adams says you're crooked listeners. Yes. All I got to do is tilt your head a little bit and everything will look just fine and you'll be in your natural environment anyway. Sunday, I went live, to use that word again, L-I-V-E, on social media to do a um, super duper simultaneous release of the two latest titles on my fabulous label, T-P-O-S. And you probably couldn't tell, but the sign was hanging somewhat askew. That's what cable TV is all about. Two new releases on TPOS, and the response so far has been really, really good. You guys have been keeping me real busy in the mailroom. So I've been teasing it for a while, but now it's official. Officially out as of, I guess, Saturday, actually. Number one, Gigi Allen and the Suicide Rehearsals CD and Cassette on TPOS. First time ever reissue of this lost album from Gigi's Lost Years. It only came out once, very briefly, on the Action label from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, with different cover art under a different name and under different circumstances, all of which are explained to the best of my ability in the liner notes. You'll notice a super snazzy six-panel fold-out digipack. Three panels on the inside. Three panels on the out. Each copy numbered. That's the lucky 99 right there. New custom artwork by my man Frank Oblack from Cleveland, Ohio. He's one of my favorite pen and ink artists. And then we got the requisite graphics and liner notes and basically every speck of material that I can round up relating to this album. And it's a very interesting story. Uh, mastered from the original production tape, courtesy of Action Records, and fully licensed and official reissue, courtesy of the estate of Mark Sheehan, who was Gigi's collaborator on this title. So it's been done up and done right. And if this thing's ever going to sound any better than this, I'll eat my hat. And it's going to be in print forever, but future issues are not going to have the six-panel digipack. They're going to have a four-panel digipack with some of the artwork condensed and some of it removed, and they will not be numbered. So if you're a collector scum like myself... Get it now. I got handy links posted to uh, Discogs and eBay on the Destructo Central page, on the GG Allen fan page, and um, kind of discreetly on my own personal page. I'm going to post full photos and links on my personal page either tonight or tomorrow, time pending. So keep an eye out for that. And not only GG Allen, but yes, the same treatment given to the great Mad Brother Ward my former bandmate in anti-scene and still TPOS recording artist, his complete anthology, all three of his 7-inch EPs, rare compilation tracks, unheard demo tracks, a smoke-in studio session with Cocknoose, once again, six-panel digipack, each copy numbered, extensive liner notes written by the Mad Brother himself, and you got it on CD. And you got it on cassette. Kind of the same deal. Once the numbered edition is gone, it's gone forever. There will be a regular non-deluxe version 
in the future. So if you want the Bona Fide first pressing, first edition, you got to get it now. Because I'm really just about halfway sold out already of both titles in both formats. And that's really good. And that's why I've been so dang busy. And I couldn't even think of something to talk about today because my brain is just swimming with mailing labels, packing tape, cardboard boxes, padded envelopes, bubble, bubble wrap, everything that packages music, but has nothing to do with music. So let's drink a toast of whatever it is you're drinking. I've got, of course, the Danbury tap to keeping me busy and off the streets of Connecticut in whatever town it might be. You won't find me laying in a gutter out there in Danbury. Nope, I'm here in the mailroom working hard to get you the good stuff. That's why I'm so busy. All right, so <clears throat> those are my excuses. Let's talk about the mailbox. We got one big old package in the mail, and you can see that it is indeed addressed correctly. Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. I love getting stuff in the mail, and this is a cold reveal from the Crawfords. I don't know what's in here. I kind of have an inkling because Greg wrote me and asked what size I wear. And he said his wife was making something for me. Let's find out. I normally don't do cold unboxings, but I think the Crawfords are probably okay. I met them at uh, the last anti-scene gig in Mobile, Alabama, and found them to be delightful people, good folks, good fun to hang out with. So here it is. This is the box. As you can see, it's sealed. It is not open. <laughs> I didn't even see what was on the side. Look at that. Those are appliques. Those are actual die-cut plastic appliques, as is the lettering on the box. I am not going to be throwing this into the recycle bin. I am going to cut this out very carefully and hang it somewhere in my office. So already... Already it's win, 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 just for the sheer, just for the sheer effort and artistry that goes into that alone. This is just the box, kids. This is just the box. Oh, and I see both the Crawfords are tuned in right now. Don't let your heads expand to the size of mine. Don't let your egos get as big as mine, kids. It gets ponderous sometimes. Ponderous, I'm telling you. All right, here we go. We are now going to open the box and we're going to open it carefully because if this, if this is kind of what I think it is, I don't want to risk damaging it. So we're going to very gently, this is not the million mile scissors. This is more like the 10,000 mile box cutter. I don't use this as much as the famous million mile scissors, but I do use it plenty. And right here live on Facebook or archived forever on the YouTube rerun on my channel. Let's see, that didn't do it. Sometimes these things have a tab you can pull. Is that the case here? No, no tab as far as I can see. All right, I, might, I, I might have to make like the first anti-scene EP and get drastic here. I'm going to actually cut into the box. But on the top, with a shallow, gentle cutting motion, In a spot where the contents are less likely to get damaged. You guys are witnessing this live. Very exciting. All right, here we go. It's open. It's open. And let's see y'all. I better put on my dollar store cheaters just so I can see what I'm seeing. A letter, handwritten letter. I'm not going to read it live on the air. I'm sure I probably could, but I'm not gonna. Because some things are meant to be personal. And something's happening here. I see... Ooh, I see all kinds of stuff here. I see a... An envelope full of mysterious paper objects. Ah, okay. I see, I see appliques. Yes. Tent Talks Tunes, kids. 
I see a T, and I bet you I'm going to see a few more T's as I unwrap this more. Okay, here's a sound piece of advice for anybody out there. Don't be a cunt cake. Oh, you kids. Oh, you can look at that. Man, that's great. How'd you guys make this? Do the, do the Crawfords wish to tune in, uh, to chime in and tell me how you guys made these? Ooh, look at that. The classic TPOS logo. Nice. Very cool. This is great, man. How'd you guys make these? I, I have no... Ah, uh, we all know this logo. We know that band. This is great. This is a this is a technology that I have no knowledge of whatsoever. I don't understand this at all. Mm, this must be a reference to Thor, the rock warrior. You know, Thor, the Thunderhawk. Here's a piece of advice from the Crawfords. Don't be a Thundercunt. Just don't do it. I agree with that completely. Totally agree with that. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, oh, okay, here's the... Um, the promised item in a in the promised size. They asked, what size do you wear? I said, adult scrawny. So here we go in adult scrawny. Hmm, the music box from Pensacola, Florida. What is this, a record store? Tell me, guys, what is this I'm flashing in front of the camera? I don't know the music box venue. What is this? What is this? Enlighten me, Crawfords. Help me out. Help me out. Yeah, all kinds of great stuff. More Tent Talks tunes. This is the very exciting thrill of Discover we got here. We got more T's, more appliques. Now this might be in adult scrawny. Ah, okay. Now Jennifer says that that was not made by her. I kind of guessed, but this, my friends, you know what this is? That's class, and I'm not even being facetious. One custom-made t-shirt with two of the best logos that these withered old eyes have ever seen. On gray. And look at that. When I eat these, I'm gonna, when I eat my meal wearing these, I'm gonna have to be extra careful so as not to dribble my vegan slop all over them. Look at that. Fantastic. Greg, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you so much. This is really, really cool. My day is generally made the minute I wake up, but now my day is super made. Thank you very, very much. And this is going to put my brain to work thinking of something I can send you guys in return because that's the way I roll. That's the way I like to do things. I take pleasure from that. And I'm sure you don't expect it, but tough titty ball. You're going to get something in return. Like it or not. Thank you, everybody. And if anybody wants to give a big thumbs up or a heart to my pals, the Crawfords, now's the time to do it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Cool. That, that is, that's enough mail right there to keep anybody busy for a little while. Let's check the bulletin board real quick. Um, not a whole lot has changed since I was on air last week. Let's see if I got the calendar within reach. Got the calendar, you know, the calendar, I hate to say it is under the camera tripod. And if I try to move that thing, it's going to be anarchy and chaos. So I'm not going to move it. Let's just say that if you want to know what's going on on the calendar, go to antiscene.com or the Anti-Scene Facebook page. You're going to find a lot of information about our upcoming gigs in March and April. We're playing great towns such as Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Mobile, Alabama, New Orleans, Louisiana, Atlanta, Georgia, Charlotte, North Carolina, and several others that I just don't remember right now. So yeah, go to those two fine, fine internet locations and you will see, read, and hear all about it. Mm, mm, mm. And thank you guys again. All right, let me wet my whistle just a smidgen here. 
I'm going to talk just an itty bitty little bit about other things happening <clears throat> in the TPOS realm because I'm, I'm a busy guy. I really try to keep busy. I don't even try to keep busy. I just always have ideas, you know, running a record label to me is not a job. It's an avocation. It's, it's a hobby that just happens to help pay my bills, you know, so I approach the label thinking about things that I want to do. I have never once ever in my entire career as a label guy released something just for the sake of releasing a moneymaker. I've, you can look through my entire catalog, which is up to 251 releases right now. There's not one single title in the entire TPOS catalog that was released just to make money. If you were to randomly pull out any item in my catalog and ask me questions about it, I would probably bore you to death with details about it. And luckily, if you go on to my Discogs page, the entire TPOS catalog is up there. Yes, a lot of it is for sale. Some of it's not. Some things are not in print anymore, as much as I try to keep them all in print. But you could look at any TPOS item on there, and each and every first slogan or one of them is a labor of love. And so I'm always having ideas about what to release. And um, I came up with one just the other night, actually just last night. And um, <clears throat> this one's going to be a, this is going to be a doozy. And this is going to be one of those that you know is not a moneymaker, but I just love the idea so much. We got to backtrack a little bit to a release that came out on TPOS. This is TPOS number 187, the Tiny Tim Isidore Fertel Split 7-inch. And um, you guys all know Tiny Tim. Maybe you don't know Isidore Fertel. Long story short, Isidore Fertel was Tiny Tim's protege. And um, Isidore Fertel only released one record ever during his lifetime, a copy of which was known to exist, but never actually seen by anybody. The weirdest thing, like Tiny Tim released an Isidore Fertel 45 on his label, but not one single copy was known to exist anywhere. And any recordings by Isidore Fertel are very thin and few on the ground. I actually tracked down one song by Isidore Fertel that was recorded by some dudes in New York City for a, a long defunct radio show. They gave me permission to use it. So I contacted my friend Justin, who is the executor of Tiny Tim's estate, and I pitched the idea of a new Tiny Tim Isidore Fertel split release to come out on CD. He countered by saying, you know what? I just found the only copy of the Isidore Fertel single in existence. One of Tiny Tim's ex-fans sent him, sent my friend Justin a copy of the Isidore Fertel record. Well, that just about blew my mind. And his mind was blown by the fact that I had tracked down this one unreleased Isidore Fertel track. Turns out that my friend Justin is sitting on a few unreleased Isidore Fertel tracks. So the wheels are turning. Nothing's actually happened yet, but we are in negotiations to release an actual Isidore Fertel record. And I don't think, I don't know if I've explained enough about Isidore Fertel other than he was Tiny's protege, but let's just say if you look up his story, it's a corker. And I think that a full-length album by Isidore Fertel is going to be quite a thing to listen to. So hopefully that's going to happen on TPOS sooner than later. Cheers to you, Isidore Fertel, wherever you are. A true trailblazer. Ah! All right, gang. Let's talk tunes. The first suggestion that I got from Murray Gilman was about Kiss. And it immediately made me think about, for some strange reason, and this is kind of like 
synchronicity. You know, I have things that are either coincidental or synchronistic. For some strange reason, out of nowhere, just a few days ago, I decided to listen to the Kiss album entitled Unmasked. Kiss. Unmasked. Now, immediately saying the name Unmasked in conjunction with Kiss, if you're a Kiss fan, that causes great schism in the ranks of Kiss fans. And um, it's for that reason that I decided to listen to it, because if you all, if you all know me, you know that I always go for the, the weird, the bizarre, the underrepresented, the maligned, the underdog. To me, that is a hell of a lot more interesting than listening to the 2023 480 gram 45 RPM speed remaster of Led Zeppelin 12 pressed on super duper, uh, you know, 25 times refined petroleum product. It's not even vinyl, it's just pure oil. I don't GA. F about that stuff, man. You know why? Because the first pressing of the first Led Zeppelin record that came out pro sounded good enough. You know, it was good enough when it came out. It's good enough now. Same thing about these much vaunted Beatles reissues. Who cares? I don't, I don't give a good goddamn about Giles Martin's remixing of any fucking Beatles record. Notice I just used profanity. That's how strongly I feel about it. Who cares? Are you going to tell me that the original wasn't good enough? And needs a remix? No. I am literally not buying it. I listened to a couple of them. Because anti-scene drummer extraordinaire Sir Barry Hannibal is a giant Beatles fan. Like, mega Beatles fan. And he went out and he got the Abbey Road remix and the Sgt. Pepper remix. He loves them. He's listened to them over and over and over again. And he made copies of them for me, and I listened to them. And it's like, okay, I understand. It's a different mix. You're here, you know, the idea is you're supposed to hear different things and hear things differently. And I played them on headphones, and I could hear the differences, but I just didn't think they were necessary. I just, I didn't see the point to the exercise, just because Giles Martin or Giles, how do you ever pronounce the dude's name? I don't effing know. Because Martin Jr. Is a, is a bigger fan of hard panning than the old man was. Okay, so you get to hear the, the instruments on the Beatles albums more hard panned. So what? Sorry, Barry, but I gotta say it. So what? I don't care. I'm like the Ramones. I don't care. He don't care. I don't care. I don't care about the Beatles reissues or anything like that. Hmm. How did I get onto that topic? How did I get there? How did I do that? I mean, I was entertained for a few minutes. I don't know if you guys were, but I felt pretty good about it. Anyway, I played Kiss Unmasked the other day. And you know what? I liked it. I liked it a lot. You know, because I'm of the generation that grew up in Kiss Mania. So, like just about everybody else, my interest in Kiss pretty much died out right before Unmasked. I'm sorry, Dynasty was released. By the time Dynasty came out, I discovered punk rock, I discovered the Stones, I discovered Cheap Trick. You know, I was on to more, you know, dare I say, sophisticated, discriminating adult type stuff. You know, and Kiss, almost overnight, was kid stuff. You know, even my youngest brother, who is four years younger than I am, and was a lot more on the Kiss tip. Even by then, he had discovered David Bowie and Alice Cooper. You know, if you got Cooper, Bowie, the Stones, and punk rock, Kiss is definitely passe. And especially with 
this particular album where they were definitely catering more toward the kiddie crowd, it seemed, we didn't want to hear this. You know, we didn't want to hear the smoother, creamier pop confections that Kiss were dishing out. And so Dynasty was just not even a blip on the radar. That was something that the little kids were listening to. And of course, by the time Unmasked came out, it was like, whatever, 1980? And, you know, Dynasty was not in yesterday's news. And Kiss Unmasked was completely irrelevant. I honestly don't even remember seeing Kiss Unmasked in the record stores when it came out. I really don't. I remember seeing displays of Dynasty all over the place. I remember going to Kmart, the Hialeah Kmart department store, and they had a, a big old pile of Unmasked on display. You know, because I was made for loving you. It was a big hit. They toured massively for it. And, you know, it, it was their last genuine hit record. <clears throat> but it was seemingly aimed squarely at the tiny tot market, the real kitty market. And those of us who got into Kiss because of Rock and Roll All Night and Destroyer and Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, you know, we, we were into for rock and roll. We didn't want to hear, you know, uh, Sean Cassidy type pop music. So Dynasty came and went and unmasked never even showed up. Unmasked was dead on arrival. So it's a record that I just never, ever listened to. At the time, nobody I knew listened to it, and I certainly wasn't going to listen to it. Until, of course, years and years and years later. Many, many years later. When I got back into Kiss with my fiendish, music-loving, record-collecting mind and wanted to see if I was wrong. You know, was I wrong back then about never ever playing Dynasty or Unmasked? Was I wrong? Let's give it a listen. Now, you'll notice that I do indeed, I have a copy of Dynasty that I'm waving around in front of you guys. This is a copy that I picked up a bunch of years ago when I bought a record collection. Standard US pressing. It's got the poster in it. I'm not going to unfold the poster, but it's got the poster. It's got the original picture sleeve, the disco kiss look, which was a big turnoff because by then disco had pretty much peaked and I wasn't even into disco anymore. Original photo label on both sides. Kiss looking very dull and bland compared to their previous look. What's really cool is this one's got a couple of uh, concert tickets taped onto the back. Where are they from? The Spectrum in Philadelphia, apparently. Pretty neat. Yeah, the Spectrum in Philly. Ticket price, 10 bucks. Concert date, September 7th, 1979. I was just about to turn 15 years old at the time, and my tastes were way more sophisticated than what Kiss had to offer at this time. So anyway, oh, Mike says that he won a copy of Dynasty as the 20th caller to Y100. Good move, dude. Very good move. So anyway, I was over Kiss, but just out of curiosity, played Unmasked, a copy of which I do not to this day have in my personal record collection. Now I wish I did because I played Unmasked and it's good. It's a good record. It's a real good record. It's a really good late 70s, early pop music album. Super slick production by Vinnie Poncia. Poncia. Again, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name. I've only read it. I've never actually tried to say it. Um, pop music, maybe a few last remnants of disco, but, you know, considering what that is, it's a really, really good album. And it's also, as it just occurred to me, the last album made by Kiss where they naturally evolved their sound. You know, you had the first five or six albums, you know, Kiss, Dressed to Kill, Hotter Than Hell, 
of course, Alive, Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, Love Gun, then Alive 2. They did those albums, all of which were kind of like, you know, standard rock and roll albums. Then they did the solo albums, whatever. Came back and they did Dynasty. And whether by hook or crook or design or accident, Dynasty came out as a very smooth, slick pop album. And listening to it now, as an old fossil, it's it's really good. It is a really, really good album if you like that kind of stuff. Excuse me, it sold a lot. It had a hit single. And so Kiss Gets Back Together makes another album that picks up from where Dynasty left off. Left off. Smoother, even poppier. I mean, pop music. How about Shandy? You want to hear like an absolute flawless FM radio pop love song? Shandy. I love that song. Really good. As Greg Crawford just said, she's so European. Um, Ace. Ace really did Torpedo Girl. Talk to me. Um, there's really, honestly, not a, not really a bad song on the album. It's a really, really good, flawless pop radio album. Von Nunny of Damn Business, 2000 Man is on there. It's excellent. And I'm definitely kind of late to the party, but I really, really like the album. And so they evolved naturally into this real pop direction. And here's one of the great mysteries of Kiss. And I know that there are probably explanations out there in articles and all that, but Kiss did not tour the U.S. to support Unmasked. I would love to know why. They toured Australia and were like gigantic, you know, for people in Australia, Unmasked is the album to go to. Like, Unmasked is the album that defines Kiss in Australia. Like, number one on the charts, number one singles, Kiss Mania. I mean, that's the one. It did pretty good business in Europe as well, because they toured Europe for Unmasked. They did not tour the U.S. for Unmasked. The album died in the U.S. And therefore, it's always been regarded as a failure. I would love to know why you can have a massive mega hit album in at least one market, but the album still be considered a total failure. I I'm pretty sure I would bet money that if they had toured for Unmasked, they could have had a hit album. And it would probably be regarded a little bit better. And when it was all over, Kiss would not be sitting around scratching their heads saying, well, gee, what do we do next? You know, and that was what defined Kiss all the way up until the 1996 reunion album. It was always a case of, well, what do we do next? You know, what do we do next? What's going to give us a hit record? What should we do in order to have a hit record next? Well, we'll make The Elder, you know, a concept album. That didn't work? Okay, well, then we'll make, um, we'll go back to Hard Rock with Creatures of the Night. That didn't work? Okay, well, uh, we'll take off the makeup. And that kind of worked, but not really. Well, then we'll get a Hot Shot Shredder guitar player. Well, that didn't work. It's like everything that they did from that point on was trying to do something to get a hit record. There was no actual natural evolution. And so I think a lot of those records really, really suffered from that. So, yeah, Kiss Unmasked. That's my take on it. And you might say, well, if you looked at the header for this week's Tent Talks tunes, I say that Kiss, Devo, and Discharge all have something in common. What do they have in common? I'll tell you what. Another hallmark of Kiss Unmasked that I noticed is that it is, and you know, maybe Dynasty's got some exceptions on it, but Kiss Unmasked is, to my ear, the first and, I would say, last album that's got some emotional honesty to it. It's got love songs. It's got broken heart songs. It's got feelings songs, even, even Gene's songs. 
which are typically, hey, baby, let me put my log in your fireplace 25 times tonight. You know, usually that's the best he can come up with. But they're actually, there's some emotional depth to the songs on Unmasked. First, I would dare say, first and only time on a Kiss record. It's got love songs instead of lust songs. So what's that got in common with another band I talked about? Well, there was indeed another album by another band that was much maligned, not liked at all, which consisted of a lot of emotionally honest songs that were not ironic and still had a fair amount of bitterness, but weren't totally consumed by bitterness. Album didn't sell for Jack when it came out and is today still a big bone of contention amongst fans. I'm talking about, yes, Total Devo by Devo. It's got all the same hallmarks that I just mentioned. And my critique of Total Devo would be the same as it is for Kiss Unmasked. It's a good album. It's a real good album. Is it a good Devo album? Mm, I would have to say no. Because people who buy Devo records, myself included, don't want to hear emotional honesty. We don't want to hear love songs. We don't want to hear human songs. We want to hear songs about the completely devolved state of the human race in life on this planet. And that's where Total Devo goes awry because as they asked at the time, the answer to the question, are we not men, is now yes. And that answer can be found many, 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 many other places than a Devo record. You don't go to a Devo record to hear that answer. No, 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 no. But I will maintain that if this, if this record had any other band name on it than Devo, it would probably be regarded as like a classic post-new wave, pre-hip-hop. I mean, it's not a hip-hop record, but it's it was released in that time, like 1988-89, when the music biz was kind of between genres, like new wave had already peaked and there wasn't anything to replace it yet, pre-grunge. If it had been a record by, you know, someone in the somebodies, people would say, yeah, really good example of a post-New Wave, pre-grunge electronic album, dude. Classic, great songs. But since it says Devo, no, no. No, 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 no. I wish it did have another name on it because I could really enjoy it a lot more without scratching my head. But as you guys know, it's Devo, so I got it. And this copy is actually a cherished possession of mine because it is the only Devo record I have that is fully autographed, signed by all five members of the band in person by me. And of course, uh, Bob too is not with us anymore. And uh, getting the other guys together in one place to get autographs, very, very difficult. So I'm very fond of this particular copy of the album. I'm also very fond of it because it features the drumming skills of David Kendrick. I'm sure you guys have heard me name check David Kendrick a few times here on Tent Talks Tunes. David Kendrick not only drummed for Devo between 1996 and I'm sorry, 1986 and 1996. Not only did he drum for them, but he drummed on the very first Sparks record I ever got, which was Angst in My Pants. Classic album, no denying it. Got David to deface the cover with an autograph. And uh, I've had the pleasure of playing with David Kendrick a few times. The dude is a phenomenal drummer, a musician's musician. He's It's really amazing because he's a dude who's about my size, which is... Petite. I'm a small dude. I don't have a whole lot of body mass. I clock in at about 136 pounds on a good day. Uh, and David Kendrick is very similar, but man, when he sits down behind the drums, he makes those things explode. Standing in front of him when he's playing the drums, it's just like a bomb going off. 
really, really cool. Absolute pleasure to have the bragging rights to say that I did it. That I did it. And the signs are pretty good that we'll be doing it again. Don't know when, don't know where, but it could be happening again. Anyway, that's the connection between Kiss and Devo, a much maligned yet emotionally honest album. And like Kiss, Devo never really went back there again. They never went back to that sort of emotional depth. They did a little bit on the 2010 album, Something for Everybody, but those songs are more the exception than the rule. There's a lot of Devo on that record. <clears throat> so then, what do Kiss and Devo have in, char in common with Discharge? Same thing. Discharge made one album that for once in their entire career wasn't about the world being nuclear annihilated. One album that I know of in the entire Discharge catalog that's not about a boot stomping on a human face forever. Only one album that has lyrics that are a little bit hopeful and a little bit not obsessed with being burned alive by an ICBM missile. Only one. And you can probably guess it's much maligned. Yes, I'm talking about Grave New World, kids. Grave New World by Discharge. Oh, yes. The only difference between Grave New World and Unmasked and Total Devo is that this record by Discharge, <clears throat> I've said it before and I'll say it again, is 100% genuinely unlistenable. Unlistenable. And I've tried. I have tried many times over the years to play Grave New World from start to finish. And inevitably, I'll drop the needle on the beginning of side one or side two sometimes just to change it up. And I'll get about five or six minutes into it. And I'm just like, okay, enough, enough, no more, please stop. Once, maybe twice, I got about halfway through a side. And it was painful, painful. In a way, it's kind of it's kind of a shame because for the first time ever, I'll reiterate, it's not all songs about being blown up by a nuclear bomb. It's just that the the music and the vocals, holy smokes, you got to hear this record. You really got to hear this record. Um, apparently, there are people who like it. I've never met one. I I would like to meet somebody who likes that record so we can explain it to me. I I don't get it. I just don't get it. But uh, yeah, emotionally, a little more vulnerable, a little more honest, and completely, utterly shot down when it came out. When, they was, when Discharge toured for Grave New World, it was a bloodbath. Absolute bloodbath. And if you want to go onto my YouTube channel, I'm pretty sure the episode where I talk about seeing Discharge on the Grave New World tour is archived. I am an eyewitness, a first-hand eyewitness to seeing Discharge Live on the Grave New World Tour. And yes, I've got the story all about it on Tent Talks Tunes, so look it up, kids. Hopefully, listening to me talk about it is as much fun as it was actually seeing it and being there. And yes, I have a recording of it. I did have the portable cassette recorder in the house and I got the whole show I should post it somewhere I really really should because it, it needs to be heard it deserves to be heard it's got to be heard so yeah that's basically it that's what Kiss Devo and Discharge have in common and of course the exception to the rule being that the Discharge record is simply no good.
And also, if you want to know how perverse my tastes are, this is the only Discharge album in my entire collection. It's the only one that I own. <laughs> because I'm just so fascinated by it. I am just fascinated. It's kind of like what I said earlier about Led Zeppelin. We already know that Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing, and Why are, you know, the pinnacle of punk rock in a lot of ways. We already know that. We don't need to talk about that. We need to know about this album and why it's so incredibly bizarrely interesting. I might try to play it again tonight. I'm not going to guarantee it, but I might. I just might. What I'm probably going to do is go online and go down the rabbit hole and see if any other recordings from the Grave New World tour have surfaced or if anybody else has posted stories about it or anything like that. That's the kind of stuff I love. And I'll invite you guys, if anybody out there has any links or information about the Grave New World tour or the recording sessions or anything relating to it, let me know. I would love to check it out. I found a few things. I have a little dossier on my hard drive about that album. I would love to know more. So yeah, help a brother out. Make a comment, leave a link. Indulge me in my magnificent obsession for albums by classic bands that are definitely not classic at all. Not classic at all. <laughs> Chill planes. <laughs> all right, Bill Coates says he's listening to it now and he's kind of digging it. All right, Bill, if you make it through the whole thing, I want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. I want to know your opinion. But you got to listen to the whole thing, okay? No cheating, no partials, no backs. The whole damn thing. That's your challenge, Bill Coat. David Austin. Okay, David. David says Grave New World rules. David, let me know. Tell me why. Tell me why you like it. I'm not... I'm not being pissy. I'm not being a smart guy. I'm not being a wise ass. I want to know, why do you like it? Because I can't figure it out. I, I want to know why you like it. David Austin says the vocals rule. Okay, there you go. The vocals drive me up a tree. David Austin likes the vocals. Can't argue with that. You can't argue with that. It's like I was telling Mike Lester last night when we were chatting. Some people like green. Some people like purple. That's all there is to it. Amy Lynn Meyer says she's going to give it a whirl. Amy, let me know. Let me know. Let's get this discussion. Let's get this, this discussion cooking. Let's see if we can create our own grave new world of discharge critique here on Tent Talks Tunes. Voila. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I love having the chance to talk to everybody about my personal taste in music and hearing about your personal taste in music. It is one of the things that make my world go round. And it gives me something to look forward to every Wednesday. Wednesday, hump day. Glad to be here. Glad to be of service. And I will be checking out your comments later and uh, seeing uh, what's going on here. Up, oh, Eric Johnson wants to, want, wants to know what my thoughts of Uniform Choice staring into the sun. You know, I haven't played that album in a long, long time. But what I remember from it was that the production on it wasn't that great. And that those guys didn't really have a feel for that kind of like melodic post hardcore. Same thing with the Unity record that they cut around that time. It seems to me like they kind of had some ideas, but they didn't really know how to fire them off. And I, I remember the production I thought was really, really cheeseball. I'd have to go back and listen to that Uniform Choice record and that Unity record again. It's, 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 it's been easily 30-something years since I played either of them. And of course now, you know, I've got more of an open mind musically. Like at the time, I was definitely more into hardcore orthodoxy than I am now. Like I wasn't really willing to give a record like that a chance. So I'd have to give, it, give that record another listen. But my main memory of it is I didn't think the production was that good. So... We'll see. I'm willing to give it another shot. Let's see. We got some other comments here. 
Okay, Bill, you see Bill's doing the exact same thing. The vocals, Cal just hits that one note. One shrieky note for the entire album. One note. It's the same note. Over and over and over again. And he makes every effort to hit it repeatedly in every single song. That's why I take the damn needle off the record. That one note. One note. One note. Gosh, the comment section is blowing up here. <laughs> Discharge really has got, uh, got people... Um, riled up here. We've got a couple of pros and we got a lot of cons. See, that's great. To me, that means that the album, just the fact that this record, the fact alone that it can make that much discussion and that much argument means it's a worthwhile record. That means it ain't boring. That means it ain't just product. That means that people feel strongly enough to check it out and react to it. And that is awesome. And that's why Tent Talks Tunes. I'm going to sign out now, guys. Thank you again for tuning in. I got a great visual to sign out with. Thanks to the Crawfords in Pensacola. I really appreciate it. I'm going to work on a little bit of reciprocity for you guys. So I hope to be back in about 167 hours time. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>